Thanks everyone for joining us uh, this morning. I appreciate um, appreciate seeing all the uh, the attendees kind of creeping up over the past ten minutes or so. Um, so today we're going to be talking about five tips for a successful bug bounty program. Uh, and you've got myself, Casey Ellis, founder CEO of Bug Crowd, and John Cran on the call. Um, just as a quick intro, so Bug, Bug Crowd is the premier platform for crowdsourced cybersecurity. Uh, we've been around for about 18 months. As you can hear, I'm not originally from the US, but we uh, we brought the company over to the Bay Area. Um, we brought the, the company over to the Bay Area, uh, you know, late last year, and uh, things have been lots of fun since. So the reason for the call, and really the reason for Bug Crowd existing in the first place, is that security is an unfair fight, and it's getting worse. All software has security bugs because let's be honest, writing secure co code is hard. You know, John and I are both recovering penetration testers. We've both run security teams at various companies. So we know what you guys are up against. Um, you're doing everything you can to reduce the risk of bugs being introduced in the first place, which is fantastic. Prevention is better than a cure. Uh, but the reality is that they still make it into production. And if you've got 100 times as many bad guys looking for them as you have good guys on your side to try to get them fixed before they get exploited, a bad outcome at some point, it's more of an issue of math than of anything else. Um, obviously, there's a bunch of other approaches to finding security vulnerabilities, you know, static code analysis, uh, vulnerability assessment tools and, and services and so on. And we believe that those are a great starting point. Um, but we also believe that, um, you know, they miss or what we see, like when you compare the output from those types of things versus what people are capable of, they miss a bunch of stuff that the bad guys actually use to get in. So yeah, just quickly by way of introduction, uh, as I mentioned, Casey, founder, CEO. Uh, my background is a pen tester. Uh, then I had this kind of weird career arc through solutions architecture into sales before I finally got bitten by the uh, the entrepreneur bug and, and started a couple of companies of which Bug Crowd has been by far the most uh, fun and interesting one I've worked on. And my name is Jonathan Cran. Um, I had previously been a Bug Crowd bug bounty hunter, got bitten by that bug really. and uh, have now joined the team as a Bug Crowd employee and previously a, a penetration tester with other firms, Rapid7, Metasploit, and Pony Express. <clears throat> so we're assuming you're here because you think that bug bounties are a good idea and you're looking for ways that they might fit into your organization. Um, so Bug Crowd actually started after a series of conversations with penetration testing customers uh, that, that I used to have. Um, companies are a lot like yours. What we noticed was they quite liked the idea of running a bug bounty program. They thought that it made sense, they liked the economics and so on. So we started asking them, you know, if you think it's worth doing, why, why aren't you already running one? Um, the cool thing was back at that point in time is the answers to those questions were basically the same across every company we spoke to. And what we did is we took that input and built Bug Crowd and our crowd control platform to handle these issues. Just to touch on what those questions were, uh, and it'd be interesting to see if uh, if any of you have been asking yourselves the same ones. Feel free to um, to drop us a note in the uh, in the go to webinar sidebar thing there. Um, first is you know I don't have enough resources right now to run my AppSec program or my information security program. Like how am I going to resource this? Um, we've built crowd control and maximised the efficiency of the process, and we've also got a triage team that's currently at eight people. So that's how we help out there. Um, another question is, um, or another concern is that I can't cap my spend. You know, if my developers suddenly push a bunch of bugs into production, does that mean I've got to pay out a ton of money? And that is a legitimate concern with an open bug bounty model. What we've done is created a, a program we call Flex. And what that does is it lets you run either a point in time or an ongoing program with a capped cost, both in terms of what you pay bug crowd to help you and what you pay out to the researchers. Um, I won't be able to pause or stop the program if I ever need to. Oops, excuse the slide change there. Um, what we've built around that is what we call this, the crowd control sandbox. And that actually lets us route researcher traffic through our infrastructure, which means we can stop it, start it, and so on. Um, payments to all of those countries would be a nightmare. I can guarantee you, uh, or assure you rather, that it totally is. Um, there are lots of things to consider with getting payments out to all these different areas in the world. Um, that's why we've spent a bunch of time getting good at it, basically, so you don't have to. Um, I won't be able to tell whether it's bounty traffic or if it's someone who's actually 
attacking my stuff. And this is an interesting objection that, that comes up or an interesting concern that people have because it goes to intent. You know, if everything that's coming in looks like it's malicious, uh, but you know that at least some of it is not, um, how are you going to tell the difference between which is which? Uh, and that's another reason that we built the sandbox. Uh, if we're routing testers through our stuff, then you get a single source IP so you can determine who's coming from us and, and everything else you can treat as, a, as still most likely being a problem. Um, and the final one, I won't know who these people are. Now, this is a really interesting one because you know our, our belief behind this is if you're running uh, an application or a system that's already on the internet, you know, you're not doing background checks or, or asking for names and details of people that can connect to that system over the internet. It's just the nature of things that, you know, whoever wants to can. Um, but we recognize that not everyone's comfortable with that just yet. So what we've done is we've built, <clears throat> excuse me, we've built an elite tier of researchers who've got a proven track, track record on our open bounties. So what they do is they do good stuff for our open customers. We use that to determine who's good at what. And then once they, once they start to bubble up, we actually vet them into the elite tier. <clears throat> Excuse me. <clears throat> so I think the TLDR for you guys to take away from this, um, you know, bug bounties are awesome, but they're also hard. That's the whole reason for this presentation. We want to equip the people that are on this call with, uh, with some tools you know, talk about some things that you've maybe not thought of before. Obviously talk about how bug crowd can help, but give you some general advice as well that you can use to apply to your own program. Um, so what we've done is, you know, we've, we've structured uh, our platform and our offerings that you know, in such a way that you can access this whole concept of crowdsourcing in a manner that suits your organization. If you want to go full Facebook style and run an open program that you can market and make a fuss about, crowd control lets you do that. If you want to run a capped cost crowdsourced penetration test, Crowd Control lets you do that too. If you want to run a capped cost ongoing program, Crowd Control lets you do that as well. The idea has been to provide flexibility on how you get started. You know, some companies want to run an open, fully loud, marketable program like Facebook and Google, uh, but most don't start there. They look at this concept, they're intrigued by it. They're not ready to go full Monty and, and do the big thing on the internet just yet but they want to start to, act, start to access the efficiencies of the model, which is why we've built this out the way we have. Um, you know, and this is the reason why. Uh, when you compare the efficacy of a group of people that are incentivized based on results versus one or two people incentivized based on effort, uh, it, you know, it makes sense logically that you're going to get a better result from the larger group of people. But you know, in case you needed some proof points on, and some numbers on uh, on how that actually looks. Here's an example of a bake-off that we did uh, against the $20,000 traditional penetration test. Um, we had 349 participants. You know, for the traditional pen test, 20K gets you about 80 hours of, uh, of work. We saw 80 hours of effort put into the program within the first eight elapsed, elapsed hours. So one of the other benefits of these programs is they're also very fast. Um, in terms of the vulnerabilities, the number of vulnerabilities that were found and, and treated as issues, you know, the traditional pen test found five, our guys found 38. So that's coverage. But then if you speak to depth and people going in and finding these really severe issues that end up, you know, being showstoppers, the kind of things that you, you have to page the engineers about and get them out of bed in the middle of the night, the traditional test didn't find any, uh, we found seven. So that's because of this model. You've got a, a group of people, they're competing against each other. They've got all these different skill sets and their incentive in how they engage is based on actually getting rewarded for what they find. Um, <clears throat> one of the things that we put out in the webinar slide, and this is really the, the, big, the big takeaway that I think everyone should, um, should have out of this. Uh, what's the one mistake that everyone makes? Um, that mistake is that people generally think that the bulk of the effort around running a bug bounty program is going to be dealing with the new vulnerabilities that they find. And definitely that's something that you need to obviously plan for and build in. And it contributes to some of the work of running a program like this, but it's not actually the bulk of the effort. Um, the main piece goes into dealing with all these people that are trying to help you, especially if their reports are invalid, out of scope or, or duplicate, because these are reports that don't necessarily add value or are actionable to your organization. But you've got someone out there on the internet who's taken time to proactively reach out and try to help you. And really, you kind of owe it to them. If, you, if you're putting it out there and saying, this is what we're going to commit to, um, 
to researchers that, that try to help us out and they do that, then you owe it to them to close the loop. Um, each bug reports an individual conversation and you know, that's, it's something to, you know, very strongly think about ahead of time. Uh, what we've done with crowd control is we've built all of our learnings around this. I mean, obviously, uh, you know, the first, the first time we learned that this was a mistake everyone makes was when we made it ourselves, right when we started the company. Um, and we've obviously been learning from that the whole way along iteratively and so on and building that into the platform to make that part of the process more efficiently. Um, we've also got a community team, which is headed up by Marissa Fagan, who used to run community for the Facebook bounty program. Their sole job is keeping the crowd happy and active and adding value to our customers as well as getting value for themselves. So yeah, that's the one mistake. Don't think it's going to be all about the bugs. It's actually mostly about the people. And I can't overstate the need to plan for this. Um, thinking about this ahead of time and making a plan for it, it'll literally make or break your program. Now I'm going to hand over to John Cran. Thanks, Casey. Um, <clears throat> we're really excited to, to share with you some of the keys to a successful program. Bugrads run over 100 programs now, and really over the course of the last two years. And um, they're, they're maybe obvious, but there's a lot of detail in running a program. And it's really about uh, these five keys. And so what we're going to do is just talk you through each of these, um, those being prepare ahead of time, aligning expectations, communicating early and often, making a change, and when you should reward a submitter, and really respecting the researcher. So let's get started with preparation. So um, this may be obvious again, but a bug bounty is going to affect your entire organization. What we found at Bug Crowd is that it really touches the developers, the security team, the sales and marketing team, and even the C-level. Um, really, the company uh, wants to know what's going on with the bug bounty program, as well as you know, sort of be able to use that as a sales and marketing tool. So it's pretty cool to be able to have an impact on security and on the organization at the same time. Um, when preparing your program, um, one of the suggestions we make is starting with low rewards. Now, this may not be obvious. Um, we, we find that folks come to us and they want to start with these high rewards and they feel really confident about their security. And oftentimes they've done a lot of work um, in order to be secure up front. You know, they're running all the latest tools. They have um, folks looking at their site anyway. Um, but we suggest starting with low rewards. Again, it's not about being cheap, but it's about finding the, the things that um, you know, the, there will be things that come up that um, you will want to fix, but they aren't necessarily the most important uh, security issue. And it's all about meeting the expectations that you've set. So if you start with a $500 minimum, um, then be prepared to pay $500 for low value issues. Um, but um, we, we work with folks to graduate those rewards as well. And so as soon as we've gotten the low hanging fruit out of the way, then we start to work up toward to access really the, the researchers who um, want higher rewards in order to participate. A couple other points here, accidental bug bounties. Um, so a fun story about that one. Um, it's really important not to communicate about your bug bounty program before it goes live. Uh, this has happened a number of times, um, both inside Bug Crowd and outside um, in the bug, bug Bounty community. Um, and when you do that, uh, you're inviting researchers to come take a look at your site without being prepared for it. Um, so one, one story that comes to mind is when we ran a uh, Bug Bounty for an organization who accidentally invited researchers to the program without setting up their program first in Bug Crowd. And so we... we worked closely with them um, in the middle of the night just to set up the program so that researchers had a place to submit issues when they came in because they already had credentials for the, for the site that they were testing. Um, and really, you want to make sure that um, all that communication is upfront and available to the researcher. Um, running out of budget is no fun. Um, it's hard to budget for a bug bounty program. It's part of the reason we came up with the flex model uh, and being able to uh, say we're only going to spend ten thousand dollars on this program is a pretty powerful tool um, and you know 
it's not always obvious how much you should budget. It's one of the things we spend the most time talking with customers about is how much uh, rewards should be placed at and how much money um, is enough in order to incentivize the type of research that they'd like to see. So that's preparation. Um, there's a number of other things in here, uh, but let's move on to the next one. Cool. Aligning expectations, much like preparation, uh, aligning expectations is all about uh, clear communication with the researcher. Your program brief is really your first line of communication. And so your program brief should uh, have things like how to report an issue, what's in scope, uh, disclosure terms, uh, how to get started as a researcher, things like um, if they need a license key, if they need um, you know, instructions in order to create an account. Um, and really, you should focus and tell folks what type of issues you want to see and what you don't want to see. Um, one of the things we use at Bug Crowd is uh, specific exceptions of things that organizations don't want to see, things like click jacking, um, things that are relatively low value that are already known issues. Uh, SSL ciphers is another example of that. Um, again, proactive communication here. You need to be able to uh, point out where you told the researcher that you didn't want to see something or that you wanted to see something when you go to process a submission. So for instance, say, say an issue comes in that's XSS, but it's um, in the brief um, underneath a site that is out of scope, um, largely because it just doesn't have value to the organization. You need to be able to point to that and tell the researcher, we, we, this is out of scope. Um, and you know, in doing so, that'll help you manage issues when, when uh, something comes in. It's all about managing expectations here. Consider your brief a living document. It's really how you task a researcher in order to come to the site and do some testing. And you'll, you'll adjust it as it goes along. Uh, here's an example of a brief. Um, this one's for Heroku, who's on Bug Crowd's platform here. And you can see the things, you know, how to report a bug is very obvious. The targets that are in scope, very obvious. Um, and, and it's all, again, about clear communication here. You can see at the top, this is what we're willing to pay. Communication, again, it's all about the researcher. Uh, bug bounties are about managing that researcher relationship. It's what Casey said up front. Um, it's the most important thing that you'll have in your program. You need to let them know what to expect and stick to your word. Word gets around in the bug bounty community pretty quickly. And so in the absence of communication, suspicion is king. And so if you're not clearly communicating and, and communicating regularly with a researcher who submitted something to you, um, you know, things, uh, it's very easy for them to wonder what's going on and to reach out and to ask. And if you're not able to respond to those quickly enough, um, it's possible that uh, the researcher um, gets confused on what's going on. So it's important to clearly communicate. And it's really not a hard thing. It's just, it's, it's time consuming. Um, this is an interesting one. This is one that's uh, sort of evolved as Bug Crowd has grown and really as the bug bounty community has grown. Casey likes to call this touch the code, pay the bug. Um, it's the golden rule. It is the golden rule. <clears throat> and it's really, uh, you know, folks, folks ask us pretty often, when should I reward a submission and how much should I reward the submission? And, you know, we, we searched long and hard for a way to um, sort of clearly communicate this. And this is what we've come up with. If you touch the code, you pay the bug. If you make a change, you should reward the submitter. Um, and really this norm has been set inside the community and researchers now expect that if a change is made, they'll be paid or, or rewarded in whatever form. What we like about this as, a, as an analyst and sort of running a program, it's a yes or a no. We're gonna make a change or we won't make a change. And even if it's out of scope, uh, this often comes up. Um, scope is one of those things that's very difficult to decide up front um, what should be in scope and what shouldn't be in scope. And of course, we push folks to include as much of the scope as possible. An example of this, um, we had a program kick off a while back that um, had a relatively small scope um, and an issue came up that was clearly out of scope, but it was clearly a major issue. Um, and we, you know, because of the community team and because of the ability to have this connection with the uh, community, they reached out and, and reported the issue, even though it was out of scope, we talked with the organization, they ended up rewarding it because it was a major issue and they made a change. Um, so in general, we, we, we say, you know, make your scope as wide as possible. Um, and even if something comes in that's out of scope, but you will change it, then it probably should be in scope in the first place. 
And just to jump in on that, we've had a question come in. Uh, what if someone finds something that I don't think is a real bug? So uh, this is kind of the easy way to build a criteria around that. Um, you know, the first thing you look at is the scope that you've, you've communicated out to the researchers. You know, have, you, have you gone out to them and said, okay, here's, here's a bunch of findings that we're not interested in, that we've got no intention of resolving because it's our company and that's our prerogative to decide what's important and what's not, right? Um, so that's the top level filter. And obviously, as you learn more, because um, what often happens is people put a bunch of stuff up front uh, and then as they're going along, um, they notice more issues coming in that, oh, you know what? I'm hearing about this a lot. I don't actually want to change it. You know what I'm going to do? I'm going to add it to the brief, put it out to the researchers so they don't waste any time looking for it or submitting it. So, you know, it's, it's all about aligning the expectations. But then on the flip side of that, if there's stuff that still falls within that category that you see that results in a code change, um, that's when you should pay regardless of what you've set up front. Absolutely. Because the right thing to do. <laughs> so another issue here, um, respect of the researcher. Um, we, we've seen programs where um, the researchers will submit something that is relatively of low value to the organization and the organization immediately discards them. Um, it's important to remember that the researcher takes significant risk when you know, going and finding issues on your site and then reporting them. Um, and really what that means is that they're putting their time into it. Um, and you know, it's important to adhere to the terms that you set up front. Um, we have lots of inexperienced researchers. We have lots of experienced researchers. It's been really interesting watching the, the array and the variety of submissions that come in. Um, I think the key here is treat everyone the same. Even in the researchers that aren't providing valuable submissions, they're being educated as you go along. Um, and the community is very small in terms of um, talking about programs. And so if, if you run into an issue where um, you're not treated with respect as a researcher, you often uh, talk about that with other researchers. And so it can decrease the amount of participation on a program. This is really a pretty straightforward thing. Treat everybody the same um, and really go back to your brief and what you said in your brief. And as long as you adhere to that, everything's great. Closing the loop on incoming submissions, this is not an obvious one. Um, ultimately, make sure that each researcher, each submission um, is managed to a close. And that's the whole reason we built the platform the way we have. And a part of that as well, just to add on to it, you know, there's, a, there's a huge variety. I mean, we've got 11,000 people signed up on the platform right now. Uh, in terms of where they are in the world, it's about 25% in the US, 25% in India, and then UK, Australia, Germany, and, and other making up the rest. And within those groups of people, you not only have like a, a broad range of skill sets, you get people in there that think like a scanner. So they think like a QA type person and they're very good at finding the simple issues. And then you've got right up to, you know, the folks that are, that are really good at thinking like they're basically what we refer to them as is good guys who think like bad guys. So when they approach this type of activity, they're thinking about if I was a criminal wanting to do something, you know, nefarious here, what would I do? It's less about the, the bug and more about the impact to the company. So there's that spectrum. But the other thing to, to just touch on with this whole concept of respecting the researcher, you know, factoring in cultural differences is really important to this because not everyone communicates and has the same sort of social norms um, to, to wherever you might be right now. So you might be used to a particular country, a particular culture and a particular way of relating. You see something come in from a different culture and your interpretation of that might be that it's you know abrupt or abrasive or offensive or whatever else. Oftentimes it's very pleasant, but in the times when it's not, what we've found is that that's usually actually a cultural thing that's that's driving that particular um, you know the the language or the attitude that comes across in the message. And if you go back to the researcher and say, hey, what gives? it turns out that they're not actually trying to be rude or abrasive. It's just how they're used to getting things done, if that makes sense. So keeping, you know, being mindful of the fact that there's lots of different cultures that are coming to the table with this. There's lots of different, you know, social norms and communication norms. Um, and you need to be mindful of that. And then, you know, have this, um, this overlying thing that we've got here, which is just 
respect them anyway, like respect regardless, give people the benefit of the doubt when they reach out to try to help you and, uh, and show them respect for the fact that they've done that. So really those five keys, just to summarize here, preparation ahead of time, aligning expectations, communicating early and often, uh, the norm of if you make a change, reward the submitter and respect for the researcher and really respect on both sides. Uh, Great. So <laughs> we are going to be fielding some questions. We've got a few more and uh, we'll be taking a look. If you guys have any more questions now, now's the time to shoot them in and we'll be answering anything you guys have in terms of bug bounties or crowdsource security in general. So let's take a look and we have a question right here. I'm interested in running a program. How do I convince upper management to approve this? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, there's a couple of ways to do it. And, and probably the main thing to keep in mind is that you want to, you want to like really highlight the benefit of the program because, you know, for upper management that haven't, gotten on board with this concept yet, you're going to need to get them comfortable with the idea. So part of it is increasing their understanding of the benefit, but the other side of it is reducing their perception of the risk. Um, a couple of the ways that we do that is, uh, is to actually run a flex bounty as the initial piece. So we'll, we'll run a, a capped cost, um, time boxed private program. Um, which is very tightly controlled and all these sorts of things. Um, without fail gets excellent results for the company and provides, you know, a way for, uh, for companies to, to dip their, their toe into the water, so to speak, and to make up a management comfortable with the, the concept of doing it at a broader scale. Um, the other thing to think about real quick with that is that this is actually a really good way. One of the things we've noticed with bug bounty programs is that they're in, an incredibly effective security awareness tool for the developers. So as a developer, if I'm sitting there and I find out that some, you know, kid from overseas somewhere in a country I've never been to um, has successfully managed to exploit my code without, you know, sitting within the four walls of the company, without knowing what that developer knows about everything else to do with the application. Um, the, you know, long story short, they believe in the boogeyman very quickly, uh, probably more quickly than anything else I've seen as a, as a security awareness tool. So that is something that, um, you know, then the conversation goes from helping a security team of five to helping train a development team of 500. Absolutely. And just to add on to that, I mean, a lot of uh, the questions that Casey uh, pointed out at the very beginning of the presentation, you know, really those pushback reasons are oftentimes what upper management will push back with. And, and Bug Crowd has, has heard those and seen those, and we have a lot of ways to address those. And it comes down to risk tolerance in some cases where folks just want to try it out. Um, and we find that the flex model is a great way to do that. Um, there's another question here uh, that's come up. Is there a low hanging fruit option? Maybe the first time running a bounty for low hanging fruit and make those out of scope later. Um, the way we usually manage this, and just as we mentioned early in the presentation, is to start with low minimums or alternatively to start with a capped cost um, bounty. Um, in, in, it comes back to the norm of if you're going to make a change, reward the submitter. And if you make a change for low hanging fruit, then there are levels that uh, submissions are rewarded at. Typically we have four levels per program. So, you know, if, it, if a bounty is for instance, um, 50 to $500, um, we then would reward low hanging fruit at $50. And oftentimes programs will start with bug crowd kudos points only in order to you know, get some of that low hanging fruit off for, you know, the minimum amount of money uh, possible. Yeah. And just to speak to that as well, the, the lower rewards, obviously they reduce the risk of, of blowing out a budget when you first kick off the program. The, the, the flip side to that, of course, is that, you know, what we, what we see, and this is like classic marketplace dynamics, um, the less you reward uh, or the less you offer out as a reward in general, the lower, the, the caliber of the issues you'll receive, right? So at some point in time, you're going to want to increase that reward to start to attract more focused attention uh, to, to, your, uh, to your platform or to your application or whatever, whatever it is that you're testing. Um, so that's, that's the dynamic there. You know, you want to start small to make sure that you, you, you're comfortable um, understanding what's going on, particularly as you go from never having done this before to finding out what you didn't know was there. And, you know, sometimes that's a shock to companies. So you want to make sure you, uh, you start slow. 
we're getting a couple questions about vetting researchers. And I just wanted to address that briefly. Um, with Bug Crowd, anybody can sign up today. Um, and you come in and you're allowed to participate in public programs. Uh, and what we do, we have a reputation engine um, that as submissions come in, those submissions are attributed to your account. And so as you provide value to the bug bounties, um, we then put you into a tier. Um, and those tiers are um, all the way from the open public stuff all the way to our elite tier, um, which is really the best researchers and the folks with um, the most submissions of high value. Uh, so here's a question. This is a good one. Can we choose which country we want our researchers to originate from? Um, this goes back to that. It goes back to what we were saying, uh, what I was saying before about the, uh, you know, the things that that we noticed that people were putting forward as reasons they haven't started this yet. Um, how do I actually know who these people are? How do I exercise some level of control of who's actually participating with this program? And, you know, I want to reiterate that if your stuff's on the web, um, basically anyone can do this anyway, and they probably are already doing it right now. Um, but if there's a reason for you to want to segment off by, by geography, um, we've, we've actually done a bunch of those. Usually the reason for that, two, well, two main ones. One is that if there's a, a particular, uh, you know, governance or sovereignty issue around inviting security researchers, um, that, that's, you know, occasionally the case and, and we can cater to that. Um, a, a more interesting and less obvious one was, uh, was a, a, an engagement that we did for a pre-release product for a customer who didn't want any testers from their country um, participating in it because they didn't want anyone within that area actually seeing these features before they were released to the general public because it was a it was a locally targeted product. Um, so yeah, you can definitely segment off via geography if that's if that's what you decide you need to do. Getting a couple other questions here. Um, one of the questions that came up is how involved are you in the processing of submissions? Really, that depends on what level of service um, you you uh, obtain from Bug Crowd. Um, we can we have the ability to um, plug in as analysts on the program in order to help you triage submissions and, and really to help you validate submissions as well. Um, so there are basically levels of service, and if you're interested in that, um, feel free to contact the sales team and they'll talk you through it. Um, to to briefly um, touch on that though, you. Literally, you can run a fully ma fully self-managed program all the way to a fully managed program with Bug Crowd. So really, it's choose your own adventure there. And one of the uh, one of the questions there is, you know, does everything get forwarded to a company email? I mean, part of the reason that we built Crowd Control. So something else to mention here is that we also let companies use Crowd Control just for their responsible disclosure program. Um, but what happens, you know, part of the idea behind how we've built that is, okay, let's get vulnerabilities out of the inbox for security teams because, you know, for one, that's not the best place for them to be. Email wasn't designed to hold that kind of data. Um, but also that email wasn't really designed for, for the sharing and federation of, of data as it comes in. You know, once you get a, a bug in, you want to make sure it gets to the right team for it to be resolved and so on. So the way we do it is it all comes through to the platform. You obviously get notified when new things happen and you log in and look at it there. And uh, if you want to uh, want to have a demo of that, we're quite happy to set that up. Um, one of the questions, here's, a, here's another good one. You know, do researchers require credentials uh, for testing the applications? It really depends on the application. Like by far the easiest uh, applications for them to jump in and test are the ones that allow self-provisioning. Uh, and then what we do with the researchers is we've, we've got some stuff in there that, that basically allows uh, the customer to have a, a very clear view on which accounts are from bug bounty researchers versus others so they can you know, adjust their analytics and, and do things like that. Um, if it's, a, if it's a, like a hard-coded, uh, not hard-coded, if it's, it's, if it's something where the, uh, you know, the account provisioning process requires intervention from the customer, generally what we'll do with that is we'll actually limit the participation of the bounty to, uh, to the top 100 or the top 200 testers and then get the customer to create, um, basically to bulk load a bunch of credentials that we, that we then pass out to the researchers via crowd control. Here's one that just came in. Um, I don't have a security team. Uh, we're a team of developers, but we're interested. Is running a bug bounty feasible? Um, the, the answer to that is yes. Um, we really have folks who are as small as two, two people all the way to the largest organizations in the world. Um, and so 
Um, really, the analyst role of looking at submissions um, is best for a technical person. And so if you have someone who can take a look at those submissions and determine whether they're um, you know, basically vet the, the submission, then you're good good to go. And if, if you need, you can certainly plug in Bug Crowd as your analyst. Great. Oh, here's another one. Um, what should I expect in the first week we're about to launch? Really, that depends on what you're launching with, um, where you have your rewards placed. Um, we find that you know the first one to two weeks with a program with um, very small uh, rewards tends to have a big bump and then tends to lower off. If you have um, you know medium to high rewards, then there tends to be a pretty constant participation. Um, and so, you know, the first week expect a lot of submissions. I mean, typically, um, with a bug crowd open program, anywhere from 100 to 500, uh, submissions within the first week. Yeah. And then generally what happens is it'll trail off, um, and it won't trail off down to zero. You'll, these programs very consistently front load. We've actually got a, a blog post up on the, uh, up on the site where we show some of the stats of, of what. Uh, the submission rate looks like um, in the first you know, two or three days. One of the things that's really interesting about it um, and what we see quite consistently as a pattern is that in the first one or two days in particular, that's when you shake all, the, all of the simple issues out. Like part of the dynamic of these programs for the researchers is that it's only the first person to find each issue that gets paid, right? Um, we do reward duplicates with points because, you know, there is, there is, um, you know, it's good, it's good to be able to provide some sort of level of reward for the participation and acknowledge the fact that it was actually a bug. Um, but we only pay for the first one. And what that means is that all the simple stuff will shake out in the first two days. Gen then generally what happens is there's a bit of a lull for two or three days after that. And that's after that, it picks back up. And that's when the interesting stuff comes in. Um, the reason for that is that it's researchers that have come in and taken a look at the application at a high level in that initial, in that initial phase. Uh, and then they've gone away for a little bit, and you know the way I've I've heard it retold is you know they're walking they're walking to walk, work down the street or driving their car or whatever it is, and they have this moment of oh wait a sec maybe I should go and check that, uh, and that's when they start to drill in and find some um, some interesting stuff you know like business logic flaws and, and different things like that. Sure. Uh, here's a question: Do I receive a report or can findings be pulled in via API? We have an API uh, that's uh, privately available, I think, at this point. Correct. Uh, so yeah, absolutely. Get in touch if you're interested in pulling in via API. Do researchers working on the same program see each other's submissions, or are they hidden? How do we deal with duplicates? Um, so researchers working on the same program would not see each other's submissions. Um, that's part of the competition model. Um, you, obviously, as the analyst, would see all the submissions. Um, how do you deal with duplicates? Um, so Bug Crowd, uh, Crowd Control basically has a uh, an engine that you can use to identify duplicates um, and mark them as such. And so uh, the key with duplicates is to respond as quickly as possible yep. um, to make sure that um, the researcher knows it's a duplicate um, and that it's been reported before. And, and ideally, um, as much as possible, push information into your brief um, that prevents researchers from going and looking for things like that again. Yeah. Yep. The other thing with duplicates is, is fixing the bug quickly. Um, you know, the, the longer the longer a bug exists in production, in general, the more people that will find it just because, you know, the, the greater period of time allows it to be found more often. Uh, so one of the things, you know, that, that helps to reduce that amount for for uh, for the customer, for the program is to uh, is to get it fixed quickly. But, yeah, just to speak to what, you know, John mentioned the, the duplicate engine within crowd control. You know, when I was talking about the things that we've built into the platform to make this process, you know, efficient as well as effective uh that's one of them but we can um we can definitely show you that and talk talk through it uh after the after the uh, call <clears throat> great so if you guys have any last questions definitely ping them through uh, this moment uh we're going to be looking at wrapping up so uh took a few seconds but uh yeah it's been a pleasure having you guys on the call i really glad you guys had time to take out your day Talk to Casey and Jay Cran and answer your questions. If you guys do have any additional questions, obviously feel free to ping us at any time. You can reach us sales at bugcrowd.com and obviously all of our details are on our website. So feel free to sign up there and just get in touch if you want to learn more. Absolutely. And thank you so much. We're going to be doing more of these. 
Um, so we'll, uh, we'll definitely keep you posted for when the next one is. And um, over the next little bit as well, we'll send out a feedback form because what we'd really love to hear, you know, the, the Q&A piece at the end of this, <clears throat> excuse me, has been super valuable. Um, what we'd love to hear from you is if there's anything else that you want to know about Bug Crowd or just bug bounty programs in general that we didn't cover because um, that's kind of how we operate, right? And we'll post the slides on the blog as well.